No, I only wear it when it's uh, not cold. You'll, you'll see it again next week. <laughs> I have a couple of purple shirts. Right out front. Uh, I thought I'd wear one today. Um, okay, what, we, can, we know how to put a halogen on, acidic conditions, okay, mechanism. What's the reactive species? We make enol, and enol gets chlorinated. Uh, we can get to this point. What's it good for? Why would you want to put a halogen there? Well, now we can do more of our, remember, SM1, SM2, E1, E2 chemistry. Now we have a good old-fashioned leaving group for those reactions. For example, we can react with the sterically hindered strong base. What type of reaction does this look like it might be going to be? E2, and the product would be we'll make the double bond over here, okay? Got two H's here, the base, take the H, electron to move in, kick off the leaving group, good old fashioned E2, okay? Now from here, this is very important type of uh, compound. This is an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. It's a carbonyl. First carbon coming off is alpha. What's the second one called? Beta. beta. And it's unsaturated here. You see this degree of unsaturation? So this is one way to make these type of compounds. Halogenate and then do a D2 elimination. These are very important. We will make these a different way later, definitely by Monday. Okay? This is one way to make them. We will also react these because the, this alkene is very reactive. We'll do what's called a Michael addition or a Michael reaction. So these are very important to be able to make, alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls. Um, Very important type of compound. Uh, super glue is that type of compound. Uh, if you look on the cover of your workbook, what do we have right here? Alpha, alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. It happens to be an ambit. Okay. And the question on the cover of the workbook. Basically, to answer it, you need to focus in on that part of the structure right there. We'll be looking at that next week. Okay, so there's one way to make them. Of course, we could do other chemistry. Maybe we could come in here with something like um, sodium cyanide. What, we, what might we propose giving as a product? Um, SN2. <laughs> no, Cyanohydrin is not bad. I mean, we could attack carbonyl and we could get a proton source. Uh, we could also maybe propose just this by an SN2. Okay? Who said cyanohydrin? Okay. That's not bad. I mean, uh, if you had a proton source, you definitely might get it. Basically, the more we learn, the more there's going to be options. And there's more of those options, the more you're going to say, well, which is going to happen? Well, we've only got another week in the class. You know, that's why you go on to organic three and organic four and organic five. And, okay. But again, the more you know, the more actually there becomes questions. But I'm, I'm going to show just an SN2. Because these are also very good for SN2. Why? Well, we learned this in organic one. So there's a few orbital next door, and the transition state, the SM2 transition state, remember it takes on sort of a, a sp2 light with a p orbital, be stabilized. Look back at the handout for organic one. These are these are very reactive, tend to be very toxic. Um, tear gas. You take acetone. Uh, some people in the lab that might not know what they're doing, doing a bromination, and then they wash their glassware with acetone. Acetone reacts with the bromine, and you get a bromine here by mechanisms we already covered. 
And you form this, and then all of a sudden your eyes start burning and turning red. So this is essentially tear gas. Because this, this, this leaving group is very activated for displacement. But that's really all back in organic one when we talk about SN2. Look at that end up. Okay. I told you about something being toxic. Ethyl chloride, uh, you know, ethyl chloride they use in sports to numb, to numb injuries. Okay, remember that? Chlorine here, you would never use this to numb. If you pull this out in a sports arena, you're going to make everybody run. It's very reactive and thus toxic. This, you can do SN2 here, sure. But it's going to take some time and heat. Okay, these are very reactive. These are also going to be very reactive once we start covering that chemistry. So halogenating is the first step to lots of more chemistry. Okay, instead of putting halogens, we, what else could we put there? We could also put deuterium there. Now deuterium is just a fancy H. So an extra, uh, I wouldn't say extra neutron, it's a, it's a proton of a neutron. And if this was halogen and hydroxide, we would put three halogens on, right? Because we have three acidic H's that we could remove with the base and then halogenate. But if we do maybe, if we include D2O and KOD, that's analogous to KOH, right? So don't let the D throw you. That's just like uh, OD minus, just like OH minus. Base. Base is going to remove an H. I'm not going to do full mechanism, but realize how we can get an anion. Once you get an anion, what can it react with? Well, you can reprotonate. Instead of putting it back on, you can react with D, put a D on. Well, then you take the other H and you do this. So the D2O can serve as the proton source, but it's really not proton. It's Sure. Once you remove that H uh, with the OD, you have HOD. Uh -huh. What's to say that the, uh, the anion doesn't take the H back off the HOD? Nothing. It can take that one too. But the idea here is that uh, you're going to flood it with D2O. And so you're going to get it to where, as long as there's some H there, it's not going to be 100% all Ds. But you can make it 99.99% D and have that little bit of H there left in equilibrium because it's, like you say, it was, you flood it with the deuterium. Now, while we're here, how do you get it back? You just come back and you flood it with proton. Because hydroxide will remove a D, just like it's an H, make the anion, and then the anion attacks the H from the water. And in this case, you have lots of H compared to D. And so you can actually easily take the D's back off. It's all just driving the equilibrium, essentially. Well, why would you want to put deuteriums on? That's often not in products. This is often done for mass spec studies. Um, also, it's easy to take back off by just sort of doing the equilibrium adjustment with lots of water. Because here, the mass of this is whatever, M. When you put three deuteriums on, how much does the mass increase by? Three, because each deuterium has a mass of one greater than the H. So you put three on. So what you can do, if you have an unknown compound and you're not sure about the structure, you can treat it with, with these reagents, then you can rerun the mass spec and see how much your mass increased by. If it increases by three, that means you have what? essentially three alpha hydrogens. More generally, it means you have three acidic hydrogens that can be exchanged with deuterium. There are other ways you could do the exchange. But in this context, so you're not going to make anion here and, in, and then have the anion react with D. Okay? Now, if your compound is precious, because you're not going to take just one molecule of this. That's impossible. You would take maybe a very small amount, and that's still a gazillion molecules. If you want to resalvage that very small amount, you can turn around 
and, and take the D back off. So for example, if you treated this compound down here with uh, D2O and KOD, how much would the mass increase by? <coughs> Somebody said eight, anybody else? There's two, H, two acidic H's here, I mean there. One, there's three. Five, three there, yes, eight, right? Do we count them right? So this is often sort of a mass spec type of ploy or something to do. Any questions about that? So you would call that exhaustive deuteration. We put his, all those deuteriums on his, where they could go. Okay. B. What was A, by the way? Yeah, it's alpha halogenation. I included in there the alpha deuteration. Okay. <coughs> so I'm making it a separate uh, letter. B, we're going to move on. And instead of putting halogens on the alpha position, we're going to put carbons. And when you add carbons, it's called alkylation. Okay. And we're going to do this without a head ketones. Aldehydes are not listed here again because aldehydes are so reactive that the chemistry is often difficult. Some of this is. Uh, we'll, the aldol reaction is very easy with aldehydes. But while this early chemistry is difficult, that's why aldehydes are not often shown. Um, and you can also do this with esters and nitrides because on the very first page we showed that um, The um, esters and nitriles, the alpha H's are also have some acidity, right? They're not quite as acidic as the uh, aldehyde's ketone. Okay, the first we'll do is direct alkylation, which, in, which implies we're going to make a carbanion, and then the lone pair is going to react like do an SN2. Now let's remember our base. If we treat this with hydroxide, we can envision making the carbanion, right? Plus water. This is an equilibrium though. What's the pKa of this guy, these H's? About 20 plus what? Water. Water's the acid over here at 16, so which side's favored? Yes, the weaker acid's favored. So that means if we treat this with hydroxide, we can't expect it to be all anion. It's actually a difference of 10 to the 4, right? What is that, 10,000? So really at equilibrium, you have 10,000 of these, and really you only have one of those. That's like what? That's like 0.01%. Only 0.01% is anion when you treat it with hydroxide. Because of that, there's still lots of hydroxide around that just wouldn't react and go that way. Now if you add in some type of uh, carbon electrophile, such as this, and you say, hey, this is going to maybe react here and we, and we can alkylate this carbon. The problem is this hydroxide <clears throat> will react there. Basically, you've got to have a strong enough base so that it's consumed and all you have is this. You need a base that's stronger than hydroxide. And the most common base to do this is called LDA. If you use LDA, it will be complete formation of the carbanion. Well, 
What is LDA? I'll draw you the structure, then tell me, tell me what the LDA stands for. LDA is
See, soda mint is just used in textbooks, really. I, it, it used to be used 100 years ago before LDA came along, and it just... Um, the chemistry is the same, though. They're both nitrogen anions, but they're, in practice, there's a huge difference. Can you not use a dry? Is what dry? So, can you not just use, like, sodomized dry? This is like a, it's a powder, right? It's like a anion, a fat ion. So can't you just, like... So I mean, is a, yeah, but you put it in that leave and it won't dissolve. Oh, but like, no, why can't you just, just have no salt for the reaction and just use it dry? In practice, that it usually doesn't work. We did some grinding last week, but um, it's, it's best to have things dissolve. Okay. Now, you might can make it work, and somebody probably has published a paper where soda been dry, but it's, nobody wants to do that. <laughs> uh, it's just it's going to be too... Too, too, too much potential for it not working with your particular system. Okay, so there's a little solvent. Uh, I hope that made some sense. I remember as an organic student uh, worrying about solvents because we just don't have that, the time to talk about that, that practical stuff. Um, okay, so obviously you got your reagent. Let's talk about pKa's. Obviously, this takes the H. Uh, okay, leave the electrons behind, we get that, plus what? Well, you just get your neutral, that's called diisopropylamine. Okay, let's judge this equilibrium. This is what, 20? Yep. What's the acid on this side? Uh, that has the H. What's the pK of that? 30. Yes, it's about 30. Now the conjugate acid would be about 10. If you're talking about this being a base, it, 10 would be the pKa you would know. We're talking about this being an acid though. It's 30. Look at the table in the back of the workbook. <coughs> this is listed. So which is favored, 20 or 30? You see how this is favored. It's a much stronger base. It's favored by 10 to the 10, which is what? 10 billion. Now that's 99.99% complete. And so when you add in your electrophile, there's none of this left. It's all this. And you get a much better reaction. So let's do some examples here. Any questions about LDA before we move on? So here's some example reactions. That's a good point. That, that's another. Solubility is important. The sterics is also important. Uh, it usually comes up at some point. You recognize and brought it up earlier. Um, Let's uh, remind me of that on the dressing a little bit. I think there's a point where we could uh, answer that easier. Good question, though. Actually, the sterics is important, but the sterics is there for a reason to keep it from doing something else. Okay, what do we got here? LDA, what's that going to do to this? In fact, we might get talk about it right now. Yeah. Here we go. LDA is used as a base, not a nucleophile. And LD and the bases take H's. So what H's are you going to take? The L star. Right. Which side? It's the same. Okay. We're going to take that. We're going to make the anion. That's what LDA does. So we take the most acidic H. Everybody agrees it's going to take the most acidic H, right? Right. Okay. Because if you're dealing with a complex molecule, you've got to first evaluate which is the most acidic H. That's it right there, this molecule. Now, what's this going to do? We throw in a carbon with a, a leaving group. We call this carbon electrophilic because nucleophiles will be attracted to it. Partial plus charge here, right? Okay. So we call it a carbon electrophile. 
I know I'm laughing? Yes. Because I cannot say that without thinking of Carmen Electra. Okay. That's, that was about 15 years ago, and I, I just can't forget it. Uh, now here, boom, take that off. What do we get? This carbon is now bonded to that carbon. That carbon now bonded to this carbon. We make that carbon-carbon bond. We alkylated the alpha carbon. Alpha carbon now has an alkyl group. Yes, part of it's aryl, but the carbon it's bonded to is alkyl. That's a good old-fashioned alkylation. Alpha alkylation. About the next one. Way to the problem. No, you just use one equivalent of LDA. You're going to convert all of your anti, all of your starting material to one equivalent of the anion. Um, we're not using excess LDA. Um, so monoalkylation is uh, very doable. See, it's because the uh, because the carbon doesn't have a lone pair. The only way to have it have, have a lone pair is the deprotonation. But if you deal with the means and you alkylate it, it's always got that lone pair. And that lone, that lone pair can always just react again, um, even if it's not dealkylated. The only way to make carbon in a nucleophile is to make a carbana. Not really, if an alkene is also a nucleophile. Okay. We're going to put an alpha group on the alpha carbon. We're going to make carbanion. And then carbanion is going to do a good old SN2. And we make that bond right there. How's it look, Russ Pretty straightforward? All right, down here. This is an ethyl, right? We're drawing the ethyl. <coughs> LDA takes the most acidic H. Where's the most acidic H? Right there, we're going to make an ion there. Are you, what about this? Is this is these CHs acidic? They're more acidic than these because it's next to the header atom, and you got you do have some good drawing. But this is the first time we've ever made a carbanion, I believe, by acid-base chemistry. And where are we making these carbonides? Next to carbonyl. So I would recommend you focus in next to carbonyl. Okay? Uh, if you make anion here, there's no resonance. It is stabilized by some induction. pK of this is about 20. Well, actually 25, right? This is an ester. This is like 40 or greater. Okay? 
We're doing alpha carbonyl chemistry. Uh, now, why did I draw in that? Because as, if the ethyl's there, I'm pretty sure you're just going to ignore it. Because it looks like you're not meant to look at it. Right? But maybe on an MCAT or standardized test, it's drawn in and it's like got some fancy color on it or something. <laughs> Is that going to make you want to make anti in here? No. No, don't fall for a trick, okay? So that's why I wanted to, you know, draw things in. There's, there's five or six ways to draw compounds. I can't draw them all different ways. So you've got to be able to, okay, well, the compound's drawn a little different. Well, I need to assess it still the same way. Should we assume that we're probably dealing with carbon chemistry? Well, hopefully they would show you a substrate that you're reacting in with. Uh, is it always carbonyl chemistry? Well, the one at the very bottom is not a carbonyl, but the one at the very bottom has a nitrile. But it's essentially alpha. No. Okay. Yeah, LDA is commonly used to make um, um, alpha carbonyl. But it's a strong base, and it can be used as a base to do anything. You have to evaluate the pKa of given hydrogen. Can LDA de deprotonate a carboxylic acid? Of course. Of course. A phenol? Of course. <coughs> Can LDA deprotonate an alcohol? Of course. That's why you say you don't want to use alcohols for uh, solid. What was the question? Is LDA used for like elimination or anything like that either? Or is it really just something that's kind of You theoretically could. Not. Theoretically could. But there's like cheaper alternatives that are also very good. Like an oxygen, like, like, like this. See, this is a very good base for elimination because of the stairs. And there's really no reason to go to the more expensive uh, LDA. Uh, so you don't really see it used much. But theoretically, yeah. OK, product here. So we make anion here. Now, the original pKa was 25. That's about 30. It's actually maybe closer to 35. Uh, I said 30 earlier. But still, LDA is sufficient to fully deprotonate this. Uh, boom, boom, until we get our We put a benzyl group on there, and there's your product. It's a direct alkylation. Direct alkylation. Okay, there was a question earlier, very uh, nice question. Uh, could LDA have added to the carbonyl, electrons up? Yes. And if you go electrons up, you can come back down and kick off the OF. And if you did that, you would end up with Maybe that, and then you can maybe also do chemistry. So why doesn't it do this? Sterics. Yes. The, the sterics of the two isopropyl groups keeps it from attacking your carbonyl as resin. Okay? Because here, if you attack carbonyl here, you could do addition elimination and eliminate off this. And you could actually get an amine. Now what about up here? Yes, you can attack carbonyl. <laughs> There's nothing to kick off. You could eventually maybe kick off the oxygen. But if you attack here, you're probably going to turn around and kick that nitrogen back off. You don't do acyl substitution here. You do more out of ketone chemistry. Okay? The sterics keeps it from adding to your carbonyl. Um, that's another reason for the isopropyl group in addition to the solubility. Okay, how about the one below? Well, remember, alpha to the cyano group is slightly acidic, pKa of 25. You can do the same chemistry here. So 
we're going to make carbanion here. It's rather than stabilizing to the nitrile. And then we do our good old SN2. And what do we put here? Ethyl, we make that bond there. <coughs> so we did a direct alkylation of our nitrile compound. How are we doing, Miranda? Jesse? So that was direct alkylation. Now let's look at indirect. Direct alkylation is fine in theory. Um, problem is, LDA is a little expensive, not as common. And so while every lab has like hydroxide or in oxygen anions, not every lab is going to have LDA. Uh, in some places of the world, it's hard to order things. It takes six months to get a chemical to come in. And so in the meantime, people like say, well, can we do this another way? Well, another way is an indirect alkylation. And it, it makes use of more common and, and weaker and easier to handle bases. Now, the oxygen anions are not, not basic enough for our simple ketones. Okay? But let's consider something like this a dicarbonyl compound. These H's in between. I have a pKa of about, now it can vary depending on what the exact groups are. I'm going to say like 10 to 12. We're out here about 20. Why are these much more acidic? Two. Oh, the anion would be stabilized by resonance into not one carbonyl, but you could do resonance into the other carbonyl as well. So you have two carbonyls that you can do resonance with. This is something often called an activated, what do you call a CH2? I told it to you before, organic one. CH3 is a methyl. What's a CH2? Methylene, N-E-T-H-Y-L-E-N-E. -E. That's why this is called methylene chloride. Or you can call it dichloromethane. Methylene, yeah. Activated <coughs> methylene compound. And generically, these can be shown as something maybe like this. Where you got a CH2 and you got two strong withdrawing groups on each side, such as the two carbonyls. Uh, what if we have two nitriles on each side? Would that be an activated methylene compound? Yeah. Yeah. Where have you seen that at? Yeah, a lot of nitrile. Okay. Particularly acidic here. I mean, we're getting down 10 to 12. Something with that type of pKa, you can fully deprotonate with an oxygen base. In this scenario, which I have, to, I think I'm just pretty much going to start here and work our way through it. First thing is to treat with oxygen anion. Now, we're using sodium ethoxide. So this is ethoxide. This is going to take an H, leave these behind, and we get this here. Of course, there's one H there remaining. Plus what? Plus ethanol. This is uh, 10 to 12. What's ethanol? 16, which side's favorite? 
And this side's favored here. That's not a huge, but it's sufficient. So your oxygen bases can be used to make anions here. Now, why do we use ethoxide and not like hydroxide? It can attack the carbonyl. Yes. The base could also attack here, electrons up, back down. If this did it and kicked that off, would you get anything new? No. You wouldn't get anything new. So your choice of base sort of matches your ester leaving group. If this was a methyl ester, you would use methoxide, probably. Does that make sense? Because it can attack the carbonyl. So, this gives this. Now we throw in a carbon electrophile. Boom, boom. What does that give? Well, it gives what's shown, right? Make that bond. So far, it's really nothing new. And we did abstract the most acidic H, right? Aren't these more acidic than these? Yes. Now, Here's where some interesting chemistry takes place, and we can also explain why it's called indirect. What do you want to call this compound? A generic name. It's a dicarbonyl compound. If that's one, this is what? Three. So it's a 1,3 dicarbonyl. Okay. Right? Makes sense. Um, more precise, a little bit more precisely, what can we call it? If that's the if we focus in on the ester and we call that alpha, what is this? Beta. beta. What's at the beta position? It's carbonyl, what functional group? Ketone. Ketone. Beta keto. Ester. It's an ester with a beta keto. Does that name make sense? Yeah. You ever heard of ketoacidosis? Yes. yes. Okay, that gets at some of those structures that you're going to see in biochem. You'll see a good amount of beta keto esters and beta keto carboxylic acids in biochem. Well, that's, that, this was also a beta keto ester. What we started with, right? We just alkylated it. Um, okay, now you treat this with H3O plus and heat. What's going to happen? Well, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to hydrolyze your ester. Okay? And so this is going to give you there. That's just an ester hydrolysis. That's test three, right? That's a beta keto ester. What's this? Beta keto acid. It's carboxylic acid. Beta keto acid. Beta keto acids will decarboxylate. They will lose CO2. We'll have to look at this mechanism next time. Let me finish up here. How do we ultimately get the final product? What is it? You got your methyl ketone, CH2, CH2 phenyl. Methyl ketone, CH2, CH2. CH2. We need to get rid of. We need to get rid of that. There's only one H here, but there's two there. This H basically needs to come here. And if we get rid of what's circled, what do we lose? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Beta keto acids easily decarboxylate. And when you do that, you get that structure, which is compound A. Now, compound A we made on the previous page by a direct route. Here we made compound A by an indirect route. We'll look at the mechanism for the decarboxylation. The indirect route allowed us to use a weaker base. But we had to start with this. One more thing, guys. This ester 
was essentially ultimately removed. The ester was used as an activating group or dummy group. And then we removed it. We'll look at these details next time. Please be looking ahead, especially at the aldol reaction. A-L-D-O-L. Aldol. Thank you.